Okay, good morning. The first thing we're going to do today is go back and, and touch up a little bit on some things that we finished rather hurriedly in the last lecture. So you might want to, in your workbook study guide, be finding uh, the pages for Korzybski and Johnson, the general semantics material on abstraction. And I'll be highlighting that again in just a minute. Uh, today we'll also be looking at dramatism, uh, the Kenneth Burke material, and we'll have some PowerPoint presentation to go with that. And then we will eventually move on into nonverbal communication. Uh, we may or may not get through with that material today. If we don't, we'll just carry that over to the next lecture as well. But as we were finishing uh, in our last class, we were looking at the nature of general semantics and how it goes beyond a representational approach and, and how the focus of the semanticist is on the naming of objects and how we establish meaning. And we said that abstraction is the process of leaving out details. So, uh, we, and we all do that, whether, whether we're abstracting about fruits or vegetables or the study guide that I've prepared for this class is an abstraction of several longer communication theory textbooks. The PowerPoint presentations are an abstraction of the lectures that I'm delivering and so forth. Uh, there are several characteristics of abstraction that we briefly mentioned last time. One, abstraction is projective. We see our own values as, rea as reality. We put ourselves into uh, a situation and, and we see it from our own point of view. Some books refer to this as ethnocentrism, seeing yourself, that's not a term you really have to remember here, but seeing yourself as the center of the universe. And we have a tendency to do that, uh, even if we're trying to be uh, nice and broad-minded and uh, recognize and not be egocentric. Still, you know, you see today in terms of what you have to accomplish and what your schedule is and the things on your agenda. Okay, multi-ordinal is another important word that we briefly mentioned, and that means that a word can mean different things to different people. Okay, the same word may mean uh, different things to different people. Test is a word that may produce anxiety for one person. Another may see it as an opportunity to show everything they've learned from the instructor's point of view. It may mean uh, more bureaucratic activity and, you know, duplicating and grading and things that have to be done. Okay, language also has a time-binding quality. Uh, we capture things in words, and, and that's a very positive, constructive uh, kind of thing. That's what enables us uh, centuries later to read Aristotle and Plato, to capture the works of Shakespeare. All of our great literature uh, we have because language has a time-binding quality. And this enables us, through this abstraction process, to project things from over time and uh, to communicate things from one person to another. You know, the, you may be a witness to a fire or an auto accident. The reporter interviews you, writes a story, puts it in the newspaper. When that's an your report is an abstraction. The reporter's article is an abstraction. Somebody reads that article and abstracts from it and tells their friend, and that person abstracts and tells someone else, and so on and on it goes. And that's one of the neat things about language. Uh, I don't know whether my cats can do this or not. I don't think so. You know, uh, I think they engage in some signal behavior and and some nonverbal behaviors, but I don't. I don't think they can relay messages uh, down the line like that. Okay, two other important terms that we get from Korzybski are indexing and dating. And indexing says that we need to recognize in this abstraction process that student one is not student two, professor one is not professor two, that, you know, if, if you're a parent, and most of you will be someday, you have three or four children, you'll quickly learn that each is unique and, and that child number one is not child number three. Well, that's the notion of indexing, and it's, it's easy if you're frustrated with one person to take that out on the next person 
or if you're really happy with one person for that to carry over. Now that that's not so bad that way. But certainly if, if I'm angry at daughter number two and daughter number three uh, comes in, I shouldn't take that out on her. Okay, so the idea of indexing says simply pay attention. You know when you go pick out fruit and vegetables at the market, you know, that this may be a really nice red juicy apple and this one's got some bug stings or bruises on it and that apple one is not apple two. And the same holds in a variety of contexts. Book one is not book two, person one is not person two. Okay, and then finally from Korzybski we pick up the term dating. And dating says that person one, who is still person one, the next time we see them, is not the same person today. You're not the same person today that you were when you left the last class. I'm not the same person today that I was when I left the last class. We've all had intervening activities, experiences, information, uh, things that may have depressed us things that may have made us happy. Uh, a variety of things occur. But it's easy to assume that the world is constant and to expect everybody around us to be consistent. Okay? Even though I know better, you know, the, the people who come in on my hallway, I expect them to be the same people today that they were last week. And sometimes we haven't changed very much, but we need to recognize there is the potential there that there's been some devastating news, that there's been some exciting news, that someone's gotten an engagement ring, that there's been a death in the family, a loss of a pet, a change in job. And all of those things say this person today is not the same person that they were 15 minutes ago, three days ago. That's the notion of dating. Okay, Wendell Johnson, who is another a semanticist who, fortunately for us, uh, wrote a much shorter book. Korzybski's book is about, I don't know, seven to eight hundred pages long. It's been a long time since I picked it up, and I have to admit I didn't read it from cover to cover. Uh, Johnson has a much shorter, readable uh, book that uh, is useful. And there are three more terms that I want to pick up. He obviously has more to say in there than these three terms, but for our purposes... Uh, it's useful to pick up these three terms that uh, abstraction is characterized by non-identity, non-allness, and self-reflexiveness. And non-identity says that A is not A, just like the map is not the territory that it represents. And we touched on that as we talked about the triangle of meaning last time and said that, that words represent things. Well, just like, you know, even if you're driving one of these little new Volkswagen bugs, you can't put it on a city map of Houston and go anywhere. And yet the map is very important, and your ability to read that map and use that map may be crucial to your travel plans, particularly if you're going somewhere you've not been before in this city. Next week I have to find some house. I think it's off out in Memorial from the looks of the address. You know, but I don't have a clue <laughs> just from the street number and house number, or from the street name and house number, where that place is. So I need to be able to read the map. But the map is not the real thing. And words are simply labels. They're symbols for what they represent. Okay, non-allness says that the word just like the map never represents all of the territory, you, no matter how detailed it is, you can't draw every house, every sidewalk, every driveway, every garage, every pothole, uh, whatever it is that, that represents reality. The map doesn't do that. Well, words are the same way. Words never tell all there is. And if you've tried to relay to someone uh, your trip to Hawaii, your African safari, if you've tried to listen to them relay it to you, uh, you know that the words only take you so far. And it's more interesting if they've got some slides or some photographs or something to go along with that. But even the words about those photographs don't do complete justice. So that's the idea of 
uh, non-allness. Self-reflexiveness is similar to this time-binding quality because it says we abstract from the abstractions infinitely. The reporter can report on the report of the fire. Uh, you know, people keep translating Aristotle and Plato and other ancient works uh, into more and more translate, or the Bible, or you know, many many works, literary works, are translated from one language to another, uh, one abstraction after another, and it's that self-reflexiveness that lets us report on things that we've not experienced directly. Okay, we're going to turn our attention now to dramatism. The work of Kenneth Burke has been very instrumental and valuable in helping us use a dramatic metaphor to understand the world about us and to communicate about uh, that particular uh, phenomenon dimension. Remember, well, probably back about lecture one, we talked about uh, types of methodologies, quantitative versus scientific methodology. And then when we got uh, last time, I believe, into the work of Bloomer and Kuhn, we said that Bloomer took a very humanistic approach to studying communication. Uh, Kuhn took a very quantitative approach with the, uh, the Chicago and Iowa schools, if you remember that discussion. Well, those methodologies kind of merge back together with the work of Kenneth, Bur Kenneth Burke. And uh, it's, it's a little more qualitative in nature than quantitative, but still there's, there's a blend of the thought there. And his most important contribution, in my opinion, for our purposes, uh, you'll also run into him in English departments, and, and he's, he's written a lot of work. I think he died about 1994, an elderly gentleman and a prolific writer. And, and you'll, if you run into a Kenneth Burke through your English classes, uh, same person. Okay, but uh, as a methodological tool, he generated what's been called, what he called, the dramatistic pentad. And this is a technique for analyzing language and thought as basic modes of action. Uh, the, it's a tool for examining a situation. It consists of the act, the actor, the scene, the purpose, the agency, and we'll look at each one of those shortly. But by looking at this five-fold analysis, uh, you can take something like the Kennedy-Nixon debates of 1960. You could take uh, the presidential campaign last fall, uh, any of, of a number of communication events, and or you could take a dialogue that you have with someone uh, out here on the campus. It doesn't have to be a great historical event. Uh, but these five parts provide a basis for analysis, and uh, they lend themselves very well to a master's thesis. If you write a chapter on act, Agency, scene, purpose, act, what do I leave out? Act, scene, agent, agency, purpose. Not sure which one I left out there. Uh, but if you write a chapter on each of those five dimensions in your analysis, add an introduction and a conclusion. If you do it in short form, then you've got good material for master's thesis. If you write a really big, long version with sophisticated research, you've probably got dissertation level material. So it's a good methodological research tool. Let's look at each one. Okay, first of all, there's an act that takes place. There's some kind of an event, whether it's Marilyn Monroe singing happy birthday to President Kennedy, whether it's uh, a, uh, what, a contested ballot election in Florida in uh, 2000, whether it's the Compromise of 1850, you know, you, you can go to any uh, situation that you want to, but there's some kind of act that's taken place. Maybe it's you on a job interview, okay? Uh, but there are all sorts of actions that are embedded in the scene that are taking place. But the act names what it is that took place. 
you got married, you got fired, there's a new baby in the family, whatever it is that people are communicating about. Okay, the agent or agents, sometimes it's one person, like a president making a keynote address, a State of the Union address. Other times it's multiple agents, parties to a debate, uh, spokespersons for uh, Ford and Firestone explaining whose fault it was that the tread came off the tires and so forth. Uh, but they're going to be communicators, the people who do the speaking, and these are the actors or agents in that particular situation. Okay? There's always some sort of scene or context in which the event takes place. And we kind of take that for granted sometimes if we're in the present tense. But if when we go back to look at historical events, then it's more important to go back and say, all right, what was the United States like in 1960? Uh, were we still in the happy days era, or was the beginning of political unrest present? What was the country like in 1850, or when George Washington was elected president? What was the scene? You know, where were we technologically? Uh, where were we as a country? Uh, you can go on into all kinds of historical analysis questions. But if, if you were using this as a methodological tool, then uh, you would be looking at those kinds of elements and uh, trying to determine what the scene is. Uh, one more little example. In 1948, you may remember seeing how you weren't around, I know. In 19, well, maybe one or two of you were. There's some people grinning out here. Uh, remember hearing about Truman's whistle stop campaign? Remember that? You remember seeing pictures of the headline from the New York Times that says, Dewey defeats Truman? Okay, we got some heads shaking heads. That was an error, wasn't it? They were wrong. Okay, because Truman was elected. Well, there have been a number of studies and analyses of that campaign to find out what happened. Okay, well, an important thing to recognize was the scene. Do you have a clue what the scene was like in 1948? We're pre-computer technology. Barely had television. Most people didn't. But the primary mode of transportation was still train. Okay. But anyway, to make this short, Truman campaigned, stumped across the country, if you will, on the back of a train and went through all these little suburbs and hamlets and little little towns across America and made speeches from the back of the train and people just loved that. You know, the train pulls in, fills up with water, refuels, does all the things that trains do when they make their little stops and here's Harry Truman out on the back, you know, waving to the people, banners flying, bunting showing and saying vote for me. Well he reached so many people in that campaign that the analysts say that's what turned the tide and caused him to be elected uh, rather than Dewey. Okay, But anyway, you could take something like the dramatistic pentad, overlay it on that, look at the act, the campaign, the agents, uh, the scene. Okay, the agency is the means of communication. And this little cover shot here represents the future where our cell phones will not only do all the things they do now, but they'll have the uh, video imaging and, and access to the internet and, you know, your life really will be linked up in the palm of your hand. But whether or not you're communicating via video uh, in the palm of your hand or if the means is simply still spoken messages, uh, the means may be thousands, hundreds of thousands of printed pamphlets that are dropped out of airplanes and some sort of propaganda campaign over Europe. You know, you have, you have as many possible channels or agencies for communicating as you do senses. And those are what? Audio, visual, 
Okay, all your senses, smell, taste, touch, ESP if you've got it. I don't, so you know, don't count on that. Uh, usually, our, our communication is taking place through our hearing and our visual, but certainly, uh, as we mentioned, as we talked about the communication process, smell and taste and touch may come into play with those. Okay, and then finally, the purpose, the why of the situation. Why is the person creating this message? Why is the actor engaging in whatever uh, the particular act is? Okay, the purpose behind the situation. The motive for the act. Okay, then Burke goes on to tell us that guilt uh, does, um, that guilt is an important concept in his overall theory, and that uh, guilt is actually what causes us to communicate with each other. And he's not talking about guilt in the sense of sin, where you might or might not go to hell if you do or don't do certain things. But he's looking at how we feel bad about ourselves due to certain circumstances, and that creates within us an impulse uh, to communicate with other people. And he says that there are three basic principles involved. The principle of the negative, the principle of perfection, and the principle of hierarchy. And in the principle of the negative, people tend to moralize and just kind of think about it. Most of us are pretty bad about being critical of other people. The odds are from elementary school on that you have been told everything that you do wrong. Now, I know there's some tendency uh, in grading tests, and, and I try to make myself shift, but, you know, once you're programmed, it's kind of hard, to check off all the things that are right, and so that at the bottom of the page you have a plus 27 instead of a minus 3. But most of the time, uh, there's, there's a tendency for your exams, your papers, to be marked wrong rather than marked right. Uh, good parents remember to tell their kids the things that they're doing right and to praise them. But certainly, most of us know we caught it most of the time when we did things wrong. You better stop that right now. I don't want you to ever do that again, etc. And that's typical of our culture. Uh, but it kind of it makes us feel bad. You know, and I think, think about all the advertising that tells us the perfect size we should be, the perfect way. This kind of leads into the principle of perfection, too, but it's, it's telling you what you are not. Principle of perfection uh, suggests that at the extreme that we're rotten, corrupted human beings who will never get it right. And in one general sense, that's true because nobody's perfect. And the person who thinks they're perfect has what wrong with them? A really big obnoxious ego, <laughs> probably. Okay, now there's some people who are a lot closer to perfect by my standards than others, you know. But there are folks that, that I think look really good, and I, ha I have a friend, you know, who, who has this little bump up here on her nose. Her nose wasn't broken, it just kind of grew that way. But I think she is really an attractive adult person, her husband thinks so. You know, but she worries about that bump on her nose. You know, or I had uh, somebody come through my office the other day that we won't name on tape, you know, who was so stressed because she had a new zit. And I couldn't even see it, you know, because she'd put about a pound of makeup on that day. But these things were important to her, and I, and I don't mean to belittle them because what's important to you is important to you, and we're all trying to look our best, you know, and I would hope if my hair were sticking straight up and back or something, you know, that uh, somebody would say, Han, you might want to go comb your hair before you get on camera. Uh, but we're all limited with what we have to work with, and, and most of us you know, do the best that we can. Uh, but the principle of perfection says that 
we're trying to be the right size. We're trying many. Now, some of you are mature enough to kind of let this stuff go. You know, but it, particularly when you're a teenager, your teeth need to look right, your hair needs to look right, on and on and on. And to the extent that we fail at that, we communicate with people about it. I mean, think about how much time you spend talking to your friends about your hair, about the clothes you're going to wear, about the diet you hope you go on, or just the things that you need to do to make you a better person, to make you more perfect. Uh -oh. Let's this one. Okay. Uh, the principle of hierarchy says that it's a natural social thing for people to rank order themselves. Remember we talked about systems theory. We said a characteristic of a system is hierarchy. And hierarchy is typical of the human experience because we're in systems, whether it's in families or at work or at school, uh, each of those, and I don't want to go back through characteristics of systems today, but you know, in this class we're in a system, in your family you're in a system, and so just naturally a hierarchy falls out of that. Someone's the head of the family, someone's the baby of the family, somebody is the head of the class. Uh, we could rank order the students by classification or academic order once we've taken a, you've taken an exam and here is something. Uh, but these social pyramids exist and, and many people spend a great deal of effort uh, trying to work themselves up and through those social pyramids so they can be either on top or closer to the top. And Burke is just saying this is a natural thing and it's characteristic of people and we need to recognize that about ourselves. Now, to the extent that we share and understand one another, then we are likely to identify with one another. And he gives the word substance, and you can kind of pronounce it two ways, the substance, the essence of th something, or the substance. You know, we all have uh, different realities, different experiences. We have stances that we take on issues and these are sub-parts of who we are. And to the extent that we share our sub-stance, whether it's politics or religion or interest in clothes or love of communication theory or favorite foods or favorite animals, when we share those sub-stances, we share substances and we identify with one another. And that's an important fundamental part of our communication. Okay, we're... Oh. This is misbehaving today. Okay, the other term we want to look at is mystification. And mystification is something that occurs in the human communication experience. Um, it's kind of that case where, where we identify with another person, but it's a one-way thing. We're, we're jumping, it's kind of like jumping over the gap, almost like a, uh, an electric arc occurs with electricity. It jumps from one point to another. Well, in mystification, it's the label that Burke gave us to uh, refer to what happens when, when we are intrigued, enamored, fascinated by celebrities, whether it's Princess Diana or Michael Jordan or Michael Jackson or uh, Martin Luther King, whomever it may be. Uh, there, there are celebrity types that we feel like we know personally. And if they are important to you, then uh, these are people that, uh, you know, they're, they're Jackie Kennedy Onassis had a great following of, pe of people who paid attention to where she went and what she wore and what she said and those kinds of things. And to the extent that that occurs, then these people influence you and you are, in a sense, mystified by them. You are uh, linked to them in the communication process. Even though it's one way, you have a strong identification with them 
And therefore, if one of those personalities uh, passes away, particularly if they die suddenly, as in the case of Princess Diana, or uh, when John F. Kennedy was assassinated, uh, this is an impactful thing uh, to the other communicators, to the other people who are in that scene, who are influenced by that. So these are important terms that we get from Kenneth Burke. Uh, the dramatistic pentad, or methodological tool, the act, the agent, the agency, the scene, the purpose, and this notion of guilt, the three basic principles of the negative, of perfection, of hierarchy. And then the concepts of substance, identification, and uh, mystification. Okay, we're going to turn our attention now to nonverbal communication. And I think you'll find this is a fun section to get into. You don't have very much material in your book about this one because this one's kind of hard to capture on paper unless we go with uh, uh, detailed graphics and so forth. So this is one, maybe one of the areas that you want to pull up under WebCT and, and review when you can the different dimensions. Okay, first we'll be talking about nonverbal signs and how signs represent things other than themselves. And some of that we've talked about already uh, when we talked about the nature of signs in general as we got ready to talk about verbal signs. And nonverbal signs involve your body, they involve spatial and vocal behaviors, and we'll go back and take a look at each of these individually in a minute. It's important to note that the many nonverbal behaviors are interrelated. You know, they, they work together to create a message. And uh, they serve different functions in human interaction, but we'll see, for example, that if a nonverbal message contradicts a verbal message, then it's probably the nonverbal message that we'll use. Okay? If somebody looks at you and says, No, I'm not angry. I told you, I told you. I told you I'm not mad. Really? Do you believe that? <laughs> You're probably going to lay low and take it easy for a while. You know, or it may be, and, and this last observation on this slide says, Listen to what is not said. Listen for deviations from the norm, okay? Because maybe you have a person around your work environment or your family who's normally a very happy, upbeat kind of person, you know, and on this day they're just real quiet. And it's not that they're crying, they're not screaming, they're just quiet. And maybe you say to them, are you okay? Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. But you know they're not because there's a deviation from what's normal. Okay, we have several areas, kinesics, proxemics, uh, uh, areas that we'll be looking at. The nonverbal communication, probably, well, you get different estimates that it constitutes 80% of our communication behaviors. Uh, one other theorist said 93%. There are some times when the nonverbal message is 100%. Maybe you've got your mouth full of food, you're listening to somebody on the phone, and you, know, you wave or you motion them into the office, and your exchange with that person is 100% nonverbal. But 80% is probably a good estimate. Nonverbal communication primarily reveals our feelings, conscious and subconscious attitudes and impressions. Okay, we'll be looking first at what are called structural uh, nonverbal theories, and they look at the way the nonverbal messages are structured. And the first is uh, by a guy named Bird Witzel, and it's called Kinesics. Kinesics is the study of body movement, facial expression, and gestures. 
but none of the stuff that you do with your mouth, the, the sounds that come out of your mouth, uh, will come under paralanguage or vocalics a little later on. But so kinesics refers to your body language. And there are, can you think of any messages that you could send with your body? Just your body? Do you think I get any messages from you when I look out there at the class? Yeah, there's a lady up front smiling and shaking her head, yes, and not saying anything. That was a nonverbal message. Yeah, some of you sit out there and, and you're very, if you see, I tried, I tried to look equally around within a reasonable span, but there are some people who are much more affirming than others. They smile, they, they give those little head nods that say, hmm, yeah, I'll keep, you know, so interesting. I'm just loving this lecture, Dr. Hahn. Uh, there are other people who are sitting out there being really quiet, hoping the camera won't catch them. Uh, I haven't seen anybody actually go to sleep in this class yet. It's probably uh, the fear of being caught on camera. But, you know, in a regular classroom, there are people occasionally who doze off, and that says boredom. There are people who are doing homework for other classes. I mean, I can tell when you're doing math rather than writing words, some things like that. Uh, but your body language says, I'm interested. And, and you know when you talk to someone, you know, does their face look animated, expressive, alert, interested? Or do they just kind of look like, oh, yeah, whatever. How much longer are you going to talk? How much do I have to endure this? Uh-huh. You know, uh, looks you used to give your parents. Do you ever have your parents say, wipe that look off your face? Okay, probably getting in trouble for that. Well, all of those are body language kinds of messages. If you see speakers who are fidgeting with their jewelry, you know, these are called adapters. Uh, it's, it's a nervous kind of behavior, and, and it's the, the need to do something and, and fix something instead of just be still. Okay. You may see celebrities twist hair, pull on earlobes, do certain things. But anyway, there are a variety of, of uh, bodily behaviors that you have available to you. Theorists have indicated that there are over 700,000 possible movements of your body, of gestures, arm movements, your torso, your feet, your legs, all of which may confer meaning from crossing your legs and wiggling your foot to standing a certain way, to tapping your toe, to drumming your fingers on the table, on and on and on. The better you know someone, <clears throat> the better you are able to predict what the nonverbal behavior of that person means, what their degree of squirming indicates, what their degree of fidgeting indicates. Uh, there are what we've called micro-momentary cues, and maybe you look over at a friend that you went to the party with, you know, and just in a split second, that little look says, I'm about done with this place. How about you? Shall we leave now? You know, I heard a couple of uh-huhs out in the audience. And it takes maybe one second to do that. Okay, it's a micro-momentary cue, but if it's shared between two people, if there's meaning in the mind of the perceiver, then communication has taken place. Body language is very important, very important, and it may contradict the verbal messages. And if it does, it's that contradiction that we believe. Okay, Bert Witzel developed seven assumptions that no body movement or expression is without meaning in the context in which it appears that body posture and movement and so forth can be systematically analyzed. It's patterned. Because it's systematic and patterned, it can be analyzed. The bodily movement is a function of the social system. Uh, it makes a difference which culture you're in as to what some gestures mean and so on. Visible bodily activity systematically influences the behavior of other members of any particular group. Uh, the people around you will simply be influenced by what you're doing. Uh, 
whether it's agitated gestures or snoring or looking bored or uh, nonverbal attempts to interrupt. Nonverbal behavior in most cases has a communicative function. Uh, usually it's, if you're communicating then the uh, nonverbal behavior will spin out of that to reinforce what you're doing. The meaning is derived from the relationship between the behavior and how it's investigated, how it fits into the context. Uh, there are certain elements that you can only analyze within the larger system. Okay, you need to know how it fits in, just like a, a frame out of a movie doesn't make much sense unless you have it in context. The same is true of uh, bodily behaviors. Okay, the next area is proxemics, and this refers to the space relationships between people. It's the study of how we use space to communicate, the distance between people, between objects, between houses even. You know, it sends a message to you when you drive through Fourth Ward and you see row houses, even if they're painted those cute little different colors. That's a different message from driving through River Oaks or some other upscale neighborhood where there are massive structures with lots of land surrounding them. They're, they're bordered with boundaries that may be tall, wrought iron, gated fences, and so forth. Uh, but the distance counts. And so Hall is looking at uh, how we use space, and it's culturally bound. It's used different ways in different cultures. Uh, you're probably aware that, that some cultures stand closer together than others. Some will get to touch later on, but some cultures are touchier than ours. But if you've ever had someone move into your space and want to talk to you too close, okay, that's a cultural deviation from what most of us in the United States, at least, are accustomed to. And I was in a context some years ago with, with a friend who liked closer contact, and it, al it always made me nervous that she talked to me here instead of there. Know. And so I would take a step backwards, and she'd take a step forward, and I'd take a step backwards. And if I had a choice of putting a chair in between or getting us to sit down at a uh, table to drink our coffee, you know, getting some kind of barrier in between was a very comfortable thing for me because that put me at the correct distance for being social. Well, Hall has identified some distances. Uh, for example, well, let, let's go through types of space first. There's, there's fixed feature space. It's, it's informal that I was about to drift into, but there's fixed feature, semi-fixed, and uh, informal space. And the fixed feature space is the stuff that cannot be moved. And here, we've got a lot of fixed feature space. The walls, the control booth, this desk I'm not going to pick up anytime soon and move anywhere. Uh, you know, the semi-fixed is the stuff like the, your desk and chairs out there. In your home, apartment or, or house, whatever you live in, you know, your walls, your windows, your doors, those are pretty much fixed unless you go to a great effort to move them. But all your furniture, or most, I've got a couple of pieces of furniture that are too big for me to move, an old piano that takes about three guys with muscles to move. You know, uh, so that I would put over in the fixed feature space as far as I'm concerned. Semi-fix those, that stuff you keep rearranging. You know, and, and some of us at least once or twice a year have to rearrange the furniture and move the lamps and move the end tables and maybe adjust the TV or uh, so forth. And that's fine. People are just like that. It's just it's one of those things that we have at our disposal that is flexible for us. Now this may make a difference in the workplace. If you have, well, I remember years ago, we had uh, uh, two secretaries who were initially, so they were work-study girls, and those were the days of typewriters. And so it was a nice sociable thing to put their desks face-to-face, uh, -face and the typewriters faced each other so the girls could type and 
Uh, then they could look up, you know, and they could talk to each other, and they could go back to typing. Only guess what happened? They talked too much. They talked a lot because it was so easy just to sit there and work and look up the birds. Yeah, yeah, okay, what'd you do last night? You know, where do you want to go for lunch? Uh, whatever it might be. So the fellow in charge of that particular office came in, moved those two desks, separated them, pushed them up against the wall, and put two file cabinets in between. Now, that didn't keep them from talking to each other, but it meant that if they wanted to talk, they had to stop talking, move their chairs backwards, and communicate around the file cabinets. So it was still a pleasant, friendly atmosphere, but they got a whole lot more work done that way. Okay, let's look at some distances. The informal space refers to the little bubbles that we carry around uh, with each other, and you've all got a bubble and some of you need more space than others. Some of us let people in uh, more readily than others. But there are certain acceptable distances that characterize uh, uh, culture in the United States. Intimate distance, personal, social, and public. Intimate distance is about 0 to 18 inches. Okay, there are certain things you just can't do unless you're at ground zero. You can't kiss each other, you can't hug somebody, okay? And it's pretty hard to pat somebody on the shoulder and say, good job, I like the way this looks. Or, you know, are you okay? Just those little warm, fuzzy kinds of things you do. And you, depending if you've got a really long arm, which I don't, you know, you might be able to do that beyond 18 inches. But most of those intimate Certainly the really intimate, which we won't discuss on tape, sorry. Uh, you know, the, the really intimate things and the warm fuzzy kinds of things are usually in that 0 to 18 inches range. And that's roughly elbows length, at least if your arms are about my size. Okay, personal distance is 18 inches to about 3 and a half or 4 feet, roughly from the tip of your nose to the tip of your fingers unless you've got arms like Akeem Olajuwon or something. Okay. In the olden days, I'm told, I wasn't around. One of my little kids once told me I was older than dirt. But I'm not old enough to remember the measuring of yardage at the general store. But I'm told by Grandma that they measured yardage at the general store in the olden days by picking up that fabric and doing this. And that was one yard. I'm getting a couple of head nods out there. You've heard this story. You weren't around for this either. You know. But that was a yard, and here was another yard. And so when you hope the person doing the measuring had really long arms, you know, because you got more fabric that way. But anyway, that's personal distance. And there are a number of things that we only do or that we need to be in personal range to do. How can you shake hands beyond three feet? Okay, how can you pat somebody on the arm? or do those personal kinds of things. But most of us don't want to be that close if we're just being sociable. You know, you're standing around eating pizza, drinking a Coke, chatting with your friends. You probably want to be at least at arm's length, maybe a little bit farther away. Yeah. So social distance is roughly 4 feet to 12 feet, depending on how crowded it is and how well you know the people those kinds of things. But that's probably where you'll find yourself standing in most social situations, just beyond arm's length. And then 12 feet or greater, Hall classifies as public distance. Okay, if it, if it gets beyond 12 feet, then it starts to feel like public speaking. Okay, I feel kind of sociable with the front row in here. Second row, it's pretty borderline. You know, but it feels like a speech to those of you in the back of the class. You know, some of you way off over there to my right and to my left, uh, I hardly get to see. And so that feels much more formal, much more impersonal. Okay, and certainly if you're making a speech in front of 10,000 people or something, you're really in a public kind of distance, public context. Okay, when people are engaged in a conversation, there are eight possible factors that are involved. And we, we can look at those to analyze the situation. We look at posture, 
and we look at sex. Are they standing up? Are they sitting down? Is it two males, two females? Doesn't matter to me, but if, you, if it were your job to analyze the situation and say what kind of communication event is taking place here, uh, those would be relevant elements. Okay, now his big words are the sociofugal and the sociopodal axis. He's really talking about how the people are related to one another. Is if, if you're in a dominant, submissive sort of state, then you'll have one person who's, who's leaning back kind of, and the dominant person may be up leaning over the other. So, so you look at the axis of the people to see you know, is one dominating over the other? Are they both on the ground looking at the sky side by side parallel? You know, maybe they're looking at the stars at night or something. What, what is their relationship to each other as far as body axis is concerned? Okay, any kinesthetic factors? And what did we say kinesics is? Okay, your body language, facial expression. Look at it. How are they looking at each other? Are they looking at each other lovingly, kindly, or do they look like they're ready to rip the hair out of the other person? Uh, clenched fists, hands on hips, pointed fingers, jerky movements. What kind of kinesthetic factors do you have? Is there touching behavior? If so, what kind of touching behavior? Are these warm, affectionate strokes, gentle touches, or you know, are they in a fist fight? Makes a difference. Visual code, are they looking at each other or not? Okay, if one is looking at the other and the other is looking down at the floor, uh, that person may be dejected, they may have been caught in a lie, they may just, you know, they may be in trouble for some reason, or if they're glaring at each other, there may be the great visual stare down taking place. Siblings have been known to do those things. Parents have been known to do those things. Okay, thermal code. Um, that may be relevant. You know, what, what kind of body heat is being given off here? <clears throat> is one person hot and sweaty? Is another cold and clammy? Is one blushing and, and glowing with that pink blush glow from embarrassment or excitement or any of the variety of things that can cause you to blush? But there's a thermal code that's involved. Olfactory code, you know what that is? Smell. <laughs> you know, do they smell wonderful? Do they smell awful? You know, maybe one of them's been cleaning fish. Or just shot up with Shalimar, you know. Uh, but, but all of these are kinds of things that play into this. And voice loudness, are they speaking softly to one another or are they screaming or some point in between? Okay, Traeger's theory of paralanguage, also called vocalics, and you'll see both of these words in books, Oh. helps us understand the notion of meta-communication. Meta-communication is communicating about communicating. And it is through our voice that we often send messages that uh, contradict, well, they can contradict or they can reinforce. But the tone of your voice plays into the overall conduct of the message. And so, the, the vocal signs can, can be used to create this boundary, particularly if there's going to be some contradiction. And those different dimensions are vocal uh, qualifiers, vocal qualities, uh, characterizers, segregates, and so forth. And you've, you've done these, you've heard people do them. Qualities of the voice include things like pitch, range, rhythm, articulation, uh, how, volume, how, how high or how low is the voice. And when things are going normally within our normal range, and this kind of takes us back to our cybernetic model uh, from the other day of, of what, are, what are the goal parameters, what, 
what's the acceptable range of behavior. We don't think about these things very much as long as things are in the normal range. But would you like for me to come in here and lecture to you in my highest possible voice? If I said, good morning, today the lecture is going to be about, how long would you want to listen to that? Not very, Not very. so yeah, they probably wouldn't air the tape, you know, because it's just painful to the ears. Uh, we have expectations that are related to gender roles. We expect guys to communicate in a certain range. We expect the women to be in a certain range. Um, you know, if, if I came in and I used this voice every day too, that would probably be some sort of strange deviation and you would not appreciate it either. It would be really hard on my voice uh, too. And uh, so, so we expect this normal uh, pitch and variety. Uh, we get accustomed to certain articulation and ranges. There are things that may not be wrong. You know, we have certainly in the, well, let me go on through these. Uh, vocal characterizers are things like laughing and crying. The day we, the first lecture we were saying, can you have uh, nonverbal spoken messages? Well, laughing and crying, those don't involve words, but they are spoken. And that's an example there. Uh, but th those kinds of things help characterize the message and give us the feel for what kind of message is occurring. Okay, the vocal qualifier, the manner in which the words are spoken, vocal segregates refer to non-fluencies, the um, uh, or um, um, uh, another type of segregates are the likes and the you knows, those are verbal segregates, but they're, they're basically useless filler in what's being presented. Some of the things that vary, of course, don't have rightness or wrongness, like regional dialects. We know that California speech typically is more clipped. Uh, some northern states have more nasal uh, influence on their language. Uh, deep, deep south states will have elongated vowels. You know, they kind of ride on the vowels. Takes them longer. To say. I have a friend from South Carolina. I just love to hear her talk, you know. But it takes her longer to get her messages. And it's not quite that bad, but but it takes longer for her to say things because. And it's hard for me to do because I'm always in a hurry. Because she spends more time on the vowels. And if you have time to listen to that, it can be very pretty. But if you're in a hurry, then you want somebody from New York or Chicago or, you know, California, somebody that will speed that message along for you. Uh, now, there are things that, that are we consider as a society errors, mispronunciations, uh, errors in articulation when you switch syllables around. Years ago, I had one relative that said aluminum instead of aluminum. You know, that's an error in pronunciation. But a, a lot of what we do with the voice is simply a difference in regionalism, uh, a difference in the quality, those kinds of things. The voice may be more nasal, uh, less nasal. It may be raspier, or hoarse, or breathy. There are varieties in there. Okay, Ekman and Friesen give us what's called a functional theory of nonverbal coding. And they look at the origin, the coding, and the usage. Okay, and you have to look at uh, where the message is coming from, who the communicators are, as you look at these three perspectives. What's the source of the act? Is it innate? Or it is innate. Uh, species constant, does it vary across cultures? What kind of coding is taking place? How is, is the act related to the meaning that's involved? And what kind of usage is the nonverbal message used to communicate? Uh, is it interactive? Is it informative? Is it an interpersonal exchange? Is it a persuasive message? Those kinds of things. 
Okay, kind of back to our uh, kinesic behavior for a minute. There are a variety of nonverbal behaviors that can be classified according to their usage. Emblems, illustrators, adapters, regulators, affect displays. And we'll get all these up here. The emblems have a direct verbal translation. Uh, it may be something like the AOK sign. Uh, uh, the AOK sign, which is that sign in this culture, has different meanings in different cultures. In some, it's an obscene gesture. A V for victory sign, um, thumbs up. Uh, there are some things that, that are more iconic in nature or have a, a direct verbal translation. Illustrators accent and emphasize. We use illustrators, for example, to tell us how big something is or how small it is, how high, how low, it's round. You normally don't say, it was very round. You know, or you give instructions to someone, you say, go down the hall, turn to the right, go three doors, and then it's the door on the left. And instinctively, for most of you at least, your hands will point the direction that you're talking about. You don't say, go down the hall and turn to your left and find the door on the right. No, that's confusing. So that's what illustrators do. They, they tell us shapes and sizes and, and give us that kind of information. Okay, adapters I mentioned earlier briefly. They, they are gestures that show the release of bodily tension. Okay, when, when you're really nervous, particularly, and you're wringing your hands and fidgeting your jewelry and just messing with stuff, okay, maybe fidgeting with ballpoint pens, and especially if you're clicking the cap and making an annoying noise that's distracting to you. But all of those are, are adaptive kinds of behaviors. And usually what your body is trying to do is get rid of some of that nervous energy. And if you can just go ahead and let yourself move, uh, then that's a relaxing, ultimately, kind of thing. But sometimes people get up to give a speech and they stand up like ten soldiers or robots, and they're just stuck in that spot. And maybe their face moves and their head moves, but their hands are either behind their back or they're crammed in their pockets or something. And that's really an abnormal thing. You know, I've, I've observed myself, I've watched my daughters, you know, lots of people on the telephone. You're on the telephone, uh, you're talking with your hand. And some of you even stick the phone under your chin and talk with both hands when there's nobody looking. Yeah. Because that's the natural kind of thing to do, whether uh, it's to illustrate or uh, whether it's... So, sometimes, you know, you're on the phone and it's nervous fidgeting because the conversation's not really going the way that you wished it would go. Okay, regulators are used to coordinate our interaction. And you, you may not have thought so much about those. But for example, when you're in a conversation, how do you know when it's your turn to talk? You ever thought about that? What does the other person do or not do? Hmm. Okay, if you're talking, if it's a polite other person, they don't talk. How do you, and you're the one not talking, and y'all remember to hold your mics down. If, if I stop talking and I want you to talk, how do you know when it's your turn? It's your turn right now. What am I doing? Waiting for an answer. Okay, I'm waiting for an answer, but I've also done something else. What have I done? What am I doing? You're asking a question. Okay, I'm asking a question, and that's a verbal behavior. Non-verbally, what am I doing? I'm looking at you. Yes, I am. Look at you people out there. I'm looking at you. And when you're chatting with someone, if you're being polite and following the rules, and remember we said there were three perspectives, systems, laws, rules for 
well, when we get on into interpersonal, we'll come to uh, specific rules relating to conversation and, and communicative behavior. But there are rules for talking to each other, for engaging in conversation. And one of the rules is if, if I ask a question or if the inflection in my voice drops a period, if I put a period at the end of the sentence, and I pause, that's a cue that it's your turn. If I look at you, it's a cue that it's your turn. If I pause and I don't look at you, it's not your turn. I'm thinking. And you've seen that you've done that. You've seen people do that. And these are little rules that you've learned implicitly throughout your lifetime. And there are some people who will get annoyed if you speak and it's not your turn. They've stopped talking. No, but they're thinking. Now you have to watch their faces, you know. There'll be some little uh, micro cues there usually. The eyes may squint. They may do some little number with their tongue. But, but it's your job to figure out, are they really through and is it your turn or are they thinking? But generally it's a sign that if, if they put a period or a question mark and look at you, then... Uh, that's a regulator that regulates the conversation and says that it's your turn. Now, of course, there's some people who don't stop talking. Okay, and if you have something you think is not in here, <laughs> uh, but if if uh, you know you're in a conversation and it's really important to you to get your piece said, then you have to watch, don't you, for an entrance. Now, when do they breathe? You know. And, and I've been in some meetings with people like that, because they don't breathe on the periods and the question marks. They sometimes don't even breathe on the dependent clauses. They, they do little catch breaths and other people. You know, if, if you've been around those folks who just keep talking and, and you can't tell where the break in the conversation is because the sentence goes on and on and there are changes in the, and I can't even do it because I'm in the habit of breathing where the punctuation is. That was what the high school speech teacher taught us. No. Uh, but, but if you're trying to figure out where to cut in at the dance, how to get into the conversation, you probably have to figure out where that person is breathing in order to cut in. Sometimes you just have to interrupt. and say, well, excuse me, but, and maybe you can ask a question, only you have to stay on track or they'll answer it and... Then you, but anyway, we're drifting into interpersonal, but you're going to have fun with that unit. Okay, the affect displays are the displays of emotion. You know, sometimes a tear just trickles down and you can't help it, or the other person can't. Or the brow is furrowed. You know, the, the nonverbal behavior is displaying the emotion. And if, when that occurs, that's what we call an affect display. Okay, Dittman's theory of emotional deviation says that what we want to do is look for the deviation from what's normal. And I mentioned that briefly before, but, th but this actually has theory status that says if, if you want to understand a behavior, look for the deviation from the norm. How is the person normally? How are they today? Uh, because we, we judge in large part the person based on how their behavior is different from what's usually seen in that particular individual in that particular culture. Okay. Within our culture, for example, and you may get these deviations uh, sometimes on the elevator. <laughs> whether here in the library or Arnold Hall or wherever. Uh, when people get on an elevator, one person gets on, no big deal. Second person gets on, what happens? Does that person get on and come over and stand right beside the first person? What did you say? 
Hold your mic down. And they move apart from one another. Okay, they move apart, don't they? I mean, unless this is somebody you know and love dearly and you are so delighted to see them. But assuming it's two strangers or two folks who barely ever seen each other, yeah, they'll split apart and they'll divide the space in half. Third person gets on, what happens? Okay, we redivide again, don't we? Into thirds. Number four gets on, we get into fourths. Two people get on together. Do they split? No, they constitute a unit. So those two, well, maybe we can make them set four or even set five. They get on and we'll split it four ways or five ways, whatever. But those two will stick together and probably keep talking to each other. And often they keep talking to each other like the other people weren't even there. Okay, and, and sometimes you listen to the conversation and you ignore it. And other times you listen to it because obviously you can hear it and you choose to participate in it. But that's a different issue. Okay, when it starts to get really crowded, we get eight or nine people on an elevator that holds ten, then what happens? There's little talking. Okay, how do you stand? I mean, you've got the space all divvied up, but what did we say about distances? Remember, intimate and social and personal space. These people are now getting into which space? They're getting in your personal space. And for most of you, that's not okay. And when people start to get into your personal space, what do you do? What do you do? Do you just stand there nose to nose and say, oh, I'm so pleased that this occurred? No. What do you do? I can't hear you. You look for a way to recapture your personal space. Are you holding your mic down? Yeah. Okay, good. Say it again a little louder. You look for a way to recapture your personal space. Okay, and how can you recapture your personal space? Good observation. Okay, you said you don't look at each other. Where do you look? Okay, some of you may look at the ceiling. Many of us look at the numbers, don't we, on the elevator? Okay, everybody starts watching those numbers go by. Just like it was the latest cartoon show on the Cartoon Network. You know, I'm so interested in those numbers. Wasn't watching them before. I mean, you kind of have to glance to see which floor you're on. You know, but you become very interested in the numbers. Everybody faces the same direction. Okay, and you can be in personal distance if you're shoulder to shoulder. You can even touch each other if you have to, if you're shoulder to shoulder facing the same direction. That's far better than being face to face. And so that's a way that we compensate. Uh, that's how we're able to pack thousands of people into the Astrodome or stadiums of different sort because you're side by side. You're not facing each other. And that offsets that. There was a study done, I don't know, several years ago now in uh, the New York subways. I don't know if anybody saw about this or not, but the degree of hostility and aggressiveness had increased in the subways. And of course, any time something, you know, if the barf bag incidence goes up on airplanes, you've got to check that out or whatever. Well, they get the consultants in to find out what's wrong. Well, what they had done was go through and uh, remove all the, they painted and, and fixed up the subway cars, taken down all the junk and the graffiti and all of this stuff. And so it was a much cleaner, prettier environment. But it meant that people didn't have anywhere to look. And so instead of looking at a blank wall, they started looking at each other. You know, which leads to that, what you looking at me for mindset. 
and we'll get to stages of hassling and provocation and so forth when we get to interpersonal. Uh, but, but that was a problem that emerged, and they eventually, I'm told, went back and, you know, put more junk up on the walls for people to look at and focus on and study and contemplate while they're riding through the subways. So we want to look at emotional deviation. We want to find out what the, what the change from normal is. But if you don't know the person well enough to know what's normal, then you won't be able uh, to spot the deviation. Okay, just some other little concepts we want to mention briefly. Artifacts refer to objects that communi communicate, such as clothing, jewelry, cars, art objects. You know, what you step into in the parking lot is very important in some groups. In other situations, people don't care uh, because the meaning is assigned by the perceiver. Okay, touch, we've talked about a little bit. Some, if you're looking for it under research ever, uh, you sometimes find it under the category of haptics. And I can't tell you why, it just is. Uh, but we know, for example, that children that have been locked away in closets, babies that spend weeks or months in incubators and isolated in hospitals, that, that there is the likelihood for uh, touch deprivation there and that touch is a very important factor within virtually every culture that I'm aware of. Uh, we'll get to Schutz's theory of interpersonal needs uh, toward the end of our interpersonal unit, but in there he says everybody needs inclusion, control, and affection, and gives us some ways that we can measure those dimensions. We don't need to go there today, uh, except to say that affection is very important and that it's one of our nonverbal needs. One of the nonverbal theorists, I think it was Morabian, but I'm not sure, said that, that Americans live in a touch-starved society, that by and large we want more touch than we're getting. So you know, if you feel like going out and giving some more, don't go out and start assaulting people today. But you know, if, if you decide to pat somebody on the shoulder or give a little extra hug, or some of those things will, you know, you could be contributing toward a better balanced uh, society and so on. Okay, chronemics refers to time and how the use of time affects our nonverbal communication. Uh, one study suggested, for example, that uh, we're either owls or larks, you know, and some folks miss this class regularly. Uh, it's being taped early in the morning by most people's standards. And so those, those owls are the people who stay up late at night who can't wake up the next morning. I, on the other hand, am a lark. You know, by 10 p.m., I'm, unless there's a real party going on, you know, I'm ready to be asleep. But by 5 a.m. or 5.30, I'm awake. Uh, particularly in summertime, I'm usually on campus by 6 or 6.30 in the morning. Uh, I was up there running off handout sheets and review sheets and all kinds of things uh, this morning before coming over here. Uh, it doesn't, you know, that's one of those things that's not a right or a wrong thing, but it's useful to know and to be honest with your friends about whether you're an owl or a lark. Uh, if, if an owl and a lark get married, they need to be real careful. You know, they need to plan their overlap time well, use it wisely, and, uh, and then certainly be respectful of other people's needs so that the radio or TV or something is not blaring when the other person's trying to sleep, uh, those kinds of things. It's something to take into account, too, when you, when you get a job. You know, uh, if, if you're a lark, you probably don't need to work the evening shift and vice versa. If you can't get out of bed and make it on time, you know, if you're an owl, you don't belong on the early shift. Uh, chronemics also is relevant. Time is treated differently in different cultures. Uh, we're uh, a more monochromatic culture in the United States where uh, most of us live on pretty tight timelines. You know, and we've got the schedule blocked out uh, it helps keep the fast food people in business, 
because you know you've only got 12 minutes to eat a hamburger before you have to be at the next point and you're even though you shouldn't be doing it you're eating your burger while you're driving or something like that in a polychromatic culture time is much more laid back latin american cultures brazil for example you know you have an appointment at 10 a.m. if they get around to seeing you by 1 or 2 o'clock that's fine you have a luncheon appointment maybe you don't go to lunch until 3 in the afternoon it's just no big deal because the the standard is different uh, the expectation is different okay then there are environmental factors that we want to be aware of that influence the way that we feel about things the color uh, the texture, uh, the amount of space that we have available, all of those affect the way that you feel about the environment that you're in. And oddly enough, well not, well, I guess it's odd, it's amazing what, what you can get research money for. <laughs> they did a study years ago on the effects of beautiful versus ugly surroundings on people. And guess what they discovered? People would rather be in beautiful surroundings. Okay? Well, you know, I guess you have to quantify these things at some point. But they actually conducted a study where they put people in teams, gave them jobs to do, and some of the folks uh, they sent off to uh, the equivalent of broom closets that were tight with rickety furniture and wadded up paper and spilled coffee on the floor. And, you know, it was just pretty blah, if not disgusting. I mean, it wasn't stinky garbage gross, you know, but it was tacky, unpleasant, ugly. Okay, and then the lucky folks got to go to the places where there were, where there was beautiful furniture, a nice view, comfy chairs, carpeting. I don't know if they had the coffee pot on or not, but you know, it was a nice place to be. And then when it was all over with, they gave the people questionnaires and asked them, uh, how did you like doing this job? You know, were you satisfied with the outcomes of your group? How did you like working with these people? Were you satisfied with the people that you had uh, to work with? Was this a pleasant experience? Would you like to do it again? And duh, guess what they said? The, the people in the beautiful surroundings said, yes, this was a great experience. These were wonderful people. I enjoyed working on this task. I would be pleased to work with these people again. I would be pleased to engage in this sort of little, I think it was problem solving activities, you know, but I'd be pleased to do this kind of task again. And the people in the ugly surroundings said, no, thanks anyway. I really didn't enjoy this. I didn't find it satisfying. I didn't find it rewarding. I didn't find these people very interesting, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the only thing that was different was the environment. So the implications for this are that if you are the president or the committee chairman or you're planning the uh, retreat for the family reunion, any of those kinds of things, then it behooves you to pick an environment that's interesting, that is pleasant, where the people will enjoy working, where they can have their lunch served while they work if this is an all-day uh, kind of environment, uh, uh, an environment where the chairs are comfortable, it's easily accessible, all of those kinds of things. So the environmental factors, but color is another factor. There are cool colors that make us relaxed and comfortable. There are lively, energetic colors. There are professional colors, uh, the burgundies and hunter greens and stuff uh, the, that upscale restaurants use. Uh, the other artifacts in your restaurants, you get real silverware and china and crystal, or do you get throwaway products? You know, all of those kinds of things work in your environment to uh, help you realize whether or not this is a pleasant experience. So this is the end of the lecture, but hopefully it's the beginning of an understanding of a whole realm of factors that are out there 
that are important that influence us in ways that we're typically not aware of. Okay, see you tomorrow.